Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to tell you that it's my pleasure to introduce Leo Mancini Resco. Leo studied at the um, Art Institute of Boston and then at the Florence Academy. At the Florence Academy, he was director of the drawing program for sculptors, and he taught courses in plain air and in materials. I was fortunate to meet Leo when he did a one-day uh, one hands-on workshop on traditional materials, and I was looking for that magic medium that I could improve my painting with. What I got instead was a much clearer understanding of all the materials and how to use them and what they could do. That was the true magic. I'd like to share a quote from Leo's website. A painting should be painted. You must see the process, the brush strokes, the creation of the ground, glazes and impostos. No two inches of any picture should be treated the same. What always drew me to painting was the contrast between rough and smooth, harsh and subtle. That's where beauty is. I couldn't agree more. And now, the very talented, his paintings are amazing, and the fabulous teacher. It's really fun. Um, you're really going to enjoy this, and you're going to learn an enormous amount about traditional materials. Leo Mancini Resco. Hopefully I said that correct, right? Yeah, that was a really nice okay. introduction. <laughs> Everybody hear me? Applause. Applause, everybody. Oh, wow. Leo. Uh, um, so I, uh, I've been teaching materials for uh, a good amount of years now. It's something that I got into when I was studying at the Florence Academy of Art. It's uh, not necessarily a required course of study while you're part of the school, but it is extremely encouraged. Dan Graves, that started the school, still grinds 90% uh, of his pigments, uh, prepares 100% of his canvases by hand. Um, it's a really, uh, if you're interested in materials, it's a very encouraging atmosphere to do so. But not everybody likes spending time grinding paint, purifying oils, and making varnishes, because all this stuff, as I imagine talking about that in a very technical way, I can sort of picture myself putting everybody in this room to sleep. Um, so I'll tell you sort of an anecdote of how I became interested in this way of working. Um, when I was a student, the uh, older student than myself who was sort of, let's say, running the materials room was Adrian Gottlieb, who came back to the States and has become a very well-known portraitist here. And I remember having these initial conversations with, with him about materials. Um, which then turned into conversations I was having with Daniel at the school. And what always attracted me to paint was this relationship that you can have with a picture, not just as a image that's on the wall that you go and look at, but the fact that if you look at a great picture from a distance, it can look oh so realistic to you. And as you get closer in the room, it can just look like this magnificent mess and sort of like a quite modern abstract picture. I mean, looking at Little pieces of a Velasquez look as modern to me as uh, many modern pictures that are on the wall. So because of this, uh, this aspect of painting being very interesting to me, this, uh, I guess you would say, like a, a more impressionistic way of viewing, that it's not everything that is not maybe explained literally, but explained through pieces of physical paint. I really like painters like... Uh, Antonio Mancini or, or uh, Ilya Repin, I mean, painters that used a good deal of paint and created this almost theatrical effect of what the painting looks like from a distance and then what it looks like up close. So, as I said, I don't like very much the idea of um, running this like just a lecture. I never liked lectures when I was in school, and I'd like to sort of stop throughout this to answer questions because the more that materials can become interactive, the easier it is to conquer what seems initially like a, a really complex subject. I never liked science in school myself, but I've learned a good deal of chemistry throughout doing this. So I have one big word for everyone. Maybe a lot of you already know this word.
The word is rheology, and it's sort of a good beginning to think about how pain, how pain is going to act. And I'll give you the definition to it in a minute. Um, this became important because as a painting student, I would go and look at great masters. I mentioned Velasquez. Everybody looks at Rembrandt with this reverence, right? You look at Rembrandt, and beyond the beautiful uh, descriptive image making he did, you look at these things up close, and they're just made of these magnificent piles of paint, you know, sort of laid down one next to the other. And for me, that's always been very enthralling. And it became frustrating as a student that I noticed that no modern picture looked anything remotely close to that sort of aesthetic. Um, the fact is, is the materials that we use today, as good or bad as they may be, they're just different than they were 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. Some are better, some are worse. The issue is that as uh, you know, modern times, everything is, is really efficiently marketed to us. You know, and I'm going to get myself in trouble, I'm sure, with the people with the tables out there. But the fact is, you know, there's down to artist soap. You know, you are told to buy artist soap because that's what will get the paint out of your brush. When in fact, any soap will get paint out of a brush. And there's some that you may like better than others, but it became this sort of thing where all paints were created equal. Any tube of white you buy is white. Does that make sense to everybody? I mean. I think, that, um, I think that this is the big, the big initial idea that you need to sort of get across in your mind when you're thinking about paint. It's not just what color it is, but how does the paint feel. Rheology is a term that was coined not very long ago, but essentially what it means is the, st the study of the flow of a semi-solid liquid substance. So paint in its liquid form or it could be toothpaste or peanut butter. It's how much does it flow and how much does it stay very stiff. It's an important term because we don't have that many descriptors that we use for oil paint. I mean, we, I'm going to put a few up on the board. and You should have heard of these, but people use terms like buttery or the paint is stiff. I mean, the, the general idea is Rheology exists between short and long paint. And paint that exhibits a short rheology, the easiest way to think about that is if you take a brush and drag that brush across a canvas with a color on it, that the brush stroke that you'll be able to pull out will be short, right? The paint is tacky. It does not flow out is the big term that they use, right? The quantity of So this is an important thing to, to, to think about, because not only are all colors sort of different by what color they are, or how fast they dry, or whatever it is, but if we can organize our thoughts, it becomes easier to pick which materials to use. I'm sure everybody's been in the position that you go in the art store, and you look at all these different tubes of paint, and you're like, oh, you know, you have this one, and you have this one. And your friend told you that this one was pretty good, but you're used to buying this one already, and that one's a little more expensive or cheaper or whatever it is. Um, this is a way of thinking about uh, how to organize paint in your head. And learning materials, um, I find to be a very similar thing to learning how to cook. It seems sort of daunting at first. Everybody eats, right? You all use paint. But at least, uh, in learning more about the process that things are made, you are not locked into cooking at home a six-hour dinner for yourself every time. It just gives you a better knowledge of how to read a label or understand what's on the box before you put it in your body. Same thing for paint, right? It's about a process to sort of understand what you're using. So paint that would exhibit a long rheology would really flow, flow far from the brush. In general terms, it is in a paint manufacturer's uh, best interest to make paint all exhibit a short or uh, buttery, as they would call it, rheology. Um, you know, an example of a very, very short white would be like um, 
the Old Holland Lead White. If anybody's used that, it's like putty, it's thick, and it doesn't pull out for a long time from the brush. An example of a paint with long rheology would be something more like uh, what that guy, and I don't know him. I talk a bit about brands, but I'm not like trying to advertise one brand or whatever to you guys. Um, the guy from uh, Natural Pigments, the paints of his that I've seen exhibit a longer rheology. So when you sort of squeeze it out of the tube, stick your brush in it, how far it flows out, how readily it mixes with other colors. Does anybody have any questions about short and long? This is like the first, the first big concept to have in mind. We're good? All right. So. In general, it is in a paint manufacturer's uh, best interest to create all paint with a sort of a uniform consistency, right? It's branding so that your paint would be, you know, if I, Leo, make a brand of paint, I would want to have a sort of signature feeling to how my paint comes off the brush. In fact, every pigment has its own rheological characteristics, and every oil has its own rheological characteristics. Paint is only made up of, realistically, can we put the camera on there? Do you see? This is just yellow ochre and linseed oil. And if you're patient with me for a second, all I'm doing is sort of mixing the same way. And I use cooking, and I like to cook, too. So um, this is similar to when you're trying to you know, wet flour if you're making bread or whatever. Initially, it's kind of hard to get together, but you want to get it to flow as one mass. So a lot of like misinformation about making paint. The first big piece of misinformation is that it's really hard to do. The second one is that it's extremely dangerous. There's a lot of things that we do that are dangerous, and there are dangers to making paint yourself. But like anything in painting, I mean, this is about learning uh, control and about learning a better uh, connection with how you do picture making. Already, at this point, if I was to use this today, This is paint. That's it. You know, this is just pigment and oil. Now, because this isn't mixed to a great degree, all I've done is sort of sit here and mix some pigment and oil together on my palette. I haven't achieved the ideal quantity of like how much oil to how much pigment. And if you don't mix it long enough, if you put it in a tube, it will separate. Everybody's had a tube of cadmium yellow light that they open and it just spills yellow oil all over the place. Maybe not everybody, but I've certainly had that experience. So in the world of just how you make paint, that's paint. You know, it's that simple. But as you can see, a lot of yellow ochre that you might use would be um, you know, more like strict paint out of the tube. This has a sort of longish, slightly stringy. Can you see this? Sorry. Yep. All right, you can see the sort of strings forming off it. See that? Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'm sort of like looking here and looking at you guys, and then there's a screen up there. Wearing a microphone is weird enough for me. Um, so that would be the sort of third characteristic, right? You could say the quantity of flow out, and eventually um, you'd start to think about how stringy something is. This is like, I'm trying to make these as simple as they can possibly be, because it seems like a daunting, overwhelming amount of information, right? But the fact is, we don't encounter, as a working artist here in the States that goes to Blick and buys a tube of Williamsburg or Michael Harding or the other guy or whoever, and you're trying to decide between the tubes, 
All of those paints are, are made to affect a slightly short and certainly not stringy, as I just showed you, rheology. Um, so that's the sort of term to think about, right? This paint is shorter than or, or longer than another. So why does that matter? Well, it matters a lot to me because if you look at painters that I greatly admire, and let's talk about Velasquez, let's talk about Rembrandt, I mean, let's talk about Titian, the really great masters, you can see uh, clearly ex exhibiting long flowing brush strokes that are difficult to replicate with today's you know, store-bought paint. Because these guys in the morning, before they started painting, they'd take 20 minutes, and that's enough yellow ochre for me for a painting session, and that's how long it took me to do it. So the color and how a paint feels changes depending on which pigment it is, but also what oil you use. You can clearly see all of these oils up here, different, you see that better like that. Like that, there you go. You can clearly see that these are different colors, right? Why does that matter? Well, where it really gets annoying is when you're trying to pick a white. And uh, if there was one color that I would recommend to all of you that would be important to make yourself, it would be your white. Whether your white is titanium or zinc or bone white or whatever it is, your white is uh, the larger proportion of the paint that you're putting down on your canvas. So the more you're affecting a control over your white, the more you're going to affect the look of your painting overall. That doesn't just mean impastos, but it's just like the general flow of the paint. So. My, my term was not all paints are created equal, not all whites are created equal. You're going to want to zoom in on that, certainly. Um, so these are all white out of the tube. They all look, you see that? There you go. I'm going to keep moving it so you can't see. Um, so all of these are white, right? And we don't need to talk yet about which brands they are. We can talk about choosing. The thing is, is about thinking about uh, why these different things happen, okay? Why one is darker, why one is lighter, why one is yellower. I do this white test every couple years. It's an important thing for me to have in my studio because, you know, like all of you guys, I go to the store and I'm like, do I buy a tube of this? Do I buy a tube of that? Do I make my own paint? How good is my paint compared to one that I buy from Williamsburg or whatever? So this is a test that I did, I would think, in 2012. And what I do is I put all the swatches down, I sort of mark what, what it is, and then I leave it to dry for at least three months. And then I put it in a dark place, so it's not receiving a lot of light. And I take it out, leave it in the light for a while, and see how everything fared. And really, you get some big surprises from doing this. And the big one that I got was about cracking. And we'll talk about that, too. So I have here a white test from 2012, I think. And here is my white test from maybe September of this year. So you can see the, the yellowing is a little less pronounced between one and another. But it's still like, if this isn't about buying tubes of white anymore. This is about like you go to Home Depot and you're trying to decide what white to paint your kitchen. Do you want like eggshell or pearly white? or they're all, they're all shades of gray, and that's really an easier way to think about your white. Um, let's go back again to the idea of like Rembrandt, Velasquez, Titian, these great masters that would sit there in the morning and either do themselves or have an assistant, just simply take some pigment and oil, mix it together until it was a, a consistency that they liked, right? And then for me, that's, this is enough paint for a painting session. These guys were so aware of how their paintings would look, not only you know, through what they wanted to paint, but also how yellow something would dry. This very concept that I'm talking about here. So when they do chemical analysis of, let's say, one of Rembrandt's portraits that has that magnificent white frock or the Van Dyke uh, Vandergeest, right? There is a different oil that is used for the face because if you use linseed oil, it's a little darker. Right? Then there is for the white frock. The white frock will want to maintain a nice whiteness. There's advantages to every oil, but those sort of distinctions, 
it would be more common to make those distinctions than not to by working artists. And this is something that although I think it's, it's wonderful that you can go down to the store and buy any variety of pigment you want from any country in the world, certainly more than these guys had at their disposal, it's a bit of a shame that people have lost the sensitivity to what oil they're going to use, what pigment they're going to use, when they think about what they want the desired effect of their painting to look like six months, a year, two years down the road in a client's house. The thing that hasn't changed at all is that in using traditional materials, you get a little bit of a greater control over what your painting will look like down the line. When I paint a portrait and I want to sell it for $10,000 to a client, I sleep a little bit better knowing that I know what my white is going to look like five or six down, years down the line, instead of when I buy a tube of paint and I'm thinking, well, it might turn out great and it might not. You really don't know what's in a tube unless, you know, unless you've done that sort of thing. You guys have any questions up until now? These are very quiet. So there's three different whites that are in common use. Um, titanium white is the most common. It is a white that has eclipsed all other whites. Titanium white is the same pigment that makes your toothpaste white. It is the same uh, pigment that is in cake frosting you give your children. It's uh, very common, uh, regarded as being pretty non-toxic white. Now, given anything in powder form you breathe, that's not great for you. But uh, titanium white is a really widely used pigment. It is by far the brightest and uh, one of the slow, that's cool, that's good for me. I like breaking up the silence once in a while. Um, so titanium white is by far the, the brightest of the whites we use. It's very dense. Um, I want to avoid getting into like the, the particulars of it. Let's just talk about how white something is. Zinc white is also very white a little bit more transparent. Lead white is the old white that was used. And uh, although lead white is, is quite a bit darker or cream colored, it has characteristics as well that are really desirable. And we'll talk about whites, because I have some whites here. We can talk about that in one second. I want to talk about oils first. So what are the oils that we use today? Right, it's pretty limited. I think I just heard all of them, like safflower, poppy, walnut, linseed. I mean, you can grind paint in other oils, but these are your basic vegetable drying oils. They're called vegetable drying oils because, you know, there's vegetable oils we don't use for painting, like olive oil. It's a non-drying oil. You mix your paint in olive oil, you put it on the canvas, it's going to stay wet for who knows how long. So. This is like, like cooking, or I, I like the cooking analogy because taste just varies so much, right? Some people are after that long, stringy kind of look, and some people aren't. You know, I have friends that I've shown, I've hand ground paint for and put it in their hands, and they just don't like it. They're used to using whatever store-bought paint that they have used for years and years. And I mean, that makes sense. It's perfectly fine. You can get things with all of the well, historically, paints were ground by hand. Generally speaking, paints ground by hand are going to be longer and stringier than ones that are made by a 600 or an 800 horsepower triple roll mill, which is so strong that it shakes a whole building when it uses. I mean, I've been in paint factories. It's really cool. It's really interesting. It's also a really far cry from what somebody would do when they were painting a commission portrait in the past. This is about knowledge. I mean, all of painting is about control and figuring out what you want so that you can create the best work possible. Sorry. Yeah. In your opinion, uh, stringy uh, paint with the long reology was the paint of the old master. Certainly. I mean, that's without doubt. 
you know, that's, that's definitely true, that, that a more old master-ish paint would have been longer, stringier, because that's just the quality that hand-ground paint has over, you know, machine-made, which didn't exist. So let's divide our oils into a couple camps. So let's say over here we have poppy, and we can say also safflower. I don't really use safflower in the studio, personally. That's going really fast. <laughs> All right, so poppy oil. Poppy oil is the brightest of the oils. It is clear. It is almost like clear oil means if you mix poppy oil with your brightest of whites, you will achieve the brightest whites possible. OK? Walnut oil is, you know, a little bit darker. Let's say, you know, just a little bit. And linseed oil would be a much darker oil. So if you want to paint a bright white sash on a client's wonderful frock or you know, an egg or whatever really white you want to paint, you are going to achieve the brightest highlight possible with that. Now, what does a paint maker call that? Windsor & Newton, I think, sells radiant white. So radiant white would be the brightest white that they make, but it's by thinking about the ingredients, you kind of know what you're getting out of the tube. You can read a tube of paint like you can anything else. It'll have the pigment index number on it and usually the oil that it's made in. I avoid things that are blends when I see more than one pigment on a tube just because that means it's something I can mix myself. My favorite is Gamblin Caucasian Flesh Tone, which is, you know, after Gamblin's Icelandic wife or something. And I think that that's... That's really interesting that they color match it, but you turn the lights off and people's skin are a different color. It's kind of a, a, a strange way to market something, where instead you can teach people how to mix that sort of, which pigments they use to mix that is already more information than they're giving you. So um, although poppy, poppy oil is wonderfully clear, it is very watery. This is a little bit more viscous. And this is very viscous. And what that means is we are going to affect shorter rheology with this side of the spectrum and longer rheology with this side. So if we want to mix our most beautiful, luscious brush stroke that would go across the ridge of someone's forehead like a Rembrandt, probably it doesn't matter in the forehead how dark it's going to get. This is what we want to go for. The other big issue is this is very slow drying. This dries also slow, not as slow. And this is a faster dry. I, I started breaking these up into camps when I was teaching in Florence, and I found this to be a really effective way for people to be able to like mentally remember when they're looking for a paint what they're looking for. The other big issue is the film, right? The film is that lovely veneer that the paint gets on top of it when it dries. But linseed oil almost doesn't need a varnish on top. It can look really luscious, just as it is. This has less film. And this has a very weak gummy film. Now, you can use different mediums. You can sun thicken oils. You can boil oils. You can do all sorts of different things to change them. But in basic terms, this is the best way, I think, to organize thinking about what oil you would like to use in which part of a project. So going back to this concept. Um, your brightest whites that you see here, whether or not they actually are advertised as, the ones that are brightest are going to be ground in a brighter oil, and they're going to be a brighter pigment like zinc or titanium. There's one problem with zinc that I found a few years ago, and I don't know if this is going to work today because this is only about six months old. One of the nice things about doing one of these uh, 
white tests on a pliable piece of canvas is I can actually roll it up and press it and see how strong this paint. Everybody talks about the great strength of lead, but it wasn't until I took a canvas and bent it that had uh, you know, pure lead that I ground myself, that I was very happy with the color with. And I also ground a lead that I was suspicious had something else in it from the fact it was a little too white, led me to believe, oh, that might have some zinc or titanium in it. Um, zinc I've found just kind of, can you see this? Zinc cracks quite a lot. And in fact, depending on which zinc we use, it'll come right off the canvas. This is called delamination. This, uh, there. You know, this is not what you want your painting to look like if ever the client needs to roll it up. Or, and again, it's something to be aware of. Like Philip DeLaslo, one of the greatest portraitists, he used zinc white for these huge impostos. People have left his paintings on the wall because they're good. They're in good shape. Um, this is a very useful knowledge to have when you're thinking about, sorry, there's my hand, there's my hand. You see the little white specks? It's kind of crazy. Uh, flake white tends, this is a flake white you see is really, really light, which would lead you to believe maybe it has some zinc or titanium in it. That comes right off. That fell on the floor and broke. That's, I mean, this is, this is, these are the differences that are helpful for us to know as artists making paintings that should last hundreds of years, like the paintings before us have. And my hand ground sort of whites tend not to have the same cracking effect. I mean, this is hand ground titanium. There's hand ground lead. It's much more pliable than other whites. Yeah. Can we do that at the end? Sinking in and oiling out and fat over lean, I like to say for the end because that's a big, that's a big discussion one. I want to finish up on whites first, if you don't mind. Um, so all these different whites have different uses as well. Some feel better, you know, if you can zoom in again. This is really funny for me. Oh, uh, look at this. Yeah, right here, right here, the two whites. There we go. I have two different whites. This is a titanium white, which is a much shorter rheology than a lead white. This particular titanium, I like the way it handles. I don't like how yellow it dries. I've, I've used it before. But this is a Williamsburg titanium, and I leave it out to show you the difference. Excuse me. The difference between that. And this is a... Uh, Harding's uh, stack lead that he made. Harding's like, you know, disclaimer, he's a friend of mine as well, but I'm not outwardly advertising his paint to you or whatever. I just think that this is really, really interesting, which is, as you can see, this is very short. This appears to be a shorter rheology than this next to it, right? This paint, as you, and this is, this is not made the way that people make lead white today, which was mostly for like insulation and fiber optic cables. If it wasn't for fiber optics, we wouldn't have lead white at all these days. That's happening much less now. So Harding started making it with vinegar and coarse manure uh, in the old fashion. As you can see, it's not as white, but what's lovely about this is as you agitate it, it becomes much stringier, much longer, much wetter, and you can even see the color changing just a bit as it wets. So this is a, a, a tube that looked extremely stiff, but as, as I'm sort of playing with it, we start getting more of these long filaments coming off it. This is why historically uh, people have used lead so much, and I really love using lead white for portraits, because it is a short paint that exhibits also long, stringy characteristics, making it very unique and very different than what you can get. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Um, I'm going to let everybody come up and sort of play with these at the end. But I think that uh, although this is like, it seems like a small deal, imagine the difference between sticking your brush and that and leaving an impasto down like that, 
you know, that you can leave this beautiful little piece of paint. Like for me, I'm very interested in that sort of uh, mosaic of little patches of paint that come up to the sum of a very uh, finished or interesting or cohesive looking image. That just creates a different look than this stuff. You know, one is very thin and filamenty, and you can sort of pull across. And to me, it reminds me a bit more of how Rembrandt would paint a beautiful gold chain on someone's neck. I used to, the gold chains would always get me. I look at them. Nobody can paint like. Well, the fact is, is, paint that was done in this manner didn't exist on the market until really recently. If it wasn't for the fiber optics sort of lead white shutting down, I don't think they would have started to do it. I think George O'Hanlon at Natural Pigments is doing it too. It's really fun stuff to use. Given it's not really white, the darkest stuff on here is stack lead. So if you're after something that's really white, that's not the white that you want to use. If you're after something that has great handling consistencies, that would be something you would be interested in using. I mean, this is what I came here to sort of show you. Just sort of put on a table a few different things. Take a little bit of the mystique away from it. I think that people are very um, uh, shocked by the idea of like, oh, grind your own paint. That, no, that sounds, who knows how many ingredients goes into it. Who knows how long that would take. Uh, demystifying this sort of thing I think is really helpful for people because in the end, buying a tube of paint is you're sort of just trusting a manufacturer who you don't know, you've never met them, and you're trusting them to give you something that should last hundreds of years on your painting. But I mean, it's further than just this like idea of how long something would last. I think it's also really important to think about like how well it handles or how easy it is to use. You know, by having a greater control over this part of our process, we have a greater control over the rest of our painting. Yeah, let's talk. The old masters used a different kind of linseed oil than we use today. I mean, it, it was washed different, and it had very different drying properties. Washing oil is very easy. It's something you can do for yourself. You can get a very raw linseed oil today wash it with water and sand. If people are interested in doing that, we can talk about how to do it. It's an easy thing to do. And a linseed oil that's straight, cold pressed with nothing that's happened to it behaves slightly differently than a linseed oil that's been washed. There's different ways to do it, but the chemical processes that we now use today to wash oils, of course, change the rheology as well. You'll find that a cold pressed oil, although it's a little bit darker than that alkali refined, whatever stuff that you buy at the store, it will behave in a really nice snappy way. And then by washing it, it even exhibits more of those characteristics. I didn't bring my washed oil for you guys. I like you very much. I brought my washed oil to the class last time. I'm saving the last of it. It takes a little while to do. But you still can still see the difference clearly between you know, one type of oil and another. We have another question. Yep. Uh, yes, you have a canvas. To the microphone, you have a canvas that you've used a lot. It's the oil primed uh, number thirteen Klassens. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got a roll, started working on it, wasn't reacting right. I figured if I had covered it with one more layer of some kind of white, that might have stabilized what was going on with the canvas. What would you use? I know that's relevant. So what, what was the problem with the initial canvas? The problem canvas? was it was a fine canvas, but it just wasn't reacting right. I figured it was the end of the roll or something. And I wondered if I had covered it with one more layer of white. Well, you need to think about what another layer would do. Like, I, not acting right is a... It wasn't, it wasn't taking the paint right. It just wasn't. Well, there's different, when we think about, we didn't, we only had time to talk about paint a little bit. My materials lectures are normally like minimum two hours. Um, the fact is, is the same way that we can break down the way that we think about our oils and our pigments for how paint behaves, we can think about also how our supports behave, right? Is it a, an um, absorbent or completely not, where is it on the spectrum of absorbency? Then where is it on the spectrum of texture, 
then where is it on the subject of how granular the actual ground is that goes on? I mean, you don't need to go that deep into the understanding of these things, but having a, a mental vocabulary to then describe what you want out of a canvas is very useful. I meet a lot of students today. I had a pregnant student recently that wanted to paint completely solvent-free. For her, I recommended using a completely non-absorbent Clayson-style canvas, although it doesn't, quote unquote, take the paint or like sink into it as you're working. For somebody that's not going to use solvent, it's really easy to move the paint around the canvas. Does that make sense? Well, it wasn't moving around the way it normally does. If you were to, yes. Uh, we're going to invite people to come up yeah. and stand around you and actually see and touch what you've done and just take a few minutes for that and then we will move on. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let's talk about sinking in. I didn't mean to. All right. So everybody come up and this and will stand be. Stand behind him, please. Not in front. Stand behind him so Here the camera have... can watch. Here we have the Please stand behind the table, white. not in front. Here we have just a normal titanium white out of the tube. Use one different palette knife for each and just feel what they're like. Now, sinking in is one of two different issues, right? Because we're now talking about the spectrum of absorbency. There's two kinds of sinking in. People will confuse absorbency, just the canvas sucking the oil into it, and call it sinking in. Then there is the breaking of fat over lean, that when you're painting on top of it, all of a sudden the whole painting just goes very mad strange. And that's something that's a little bit different. So there's two different types of sinking in that people are generally talking about. I find that usually people are more talking about absorbency, that they want a less absorbent canvas to start with. And the easiest way to, to combat that is by just putting even a retouch varnish on top of the canvas before you start. Very, very fine, but enough that it'll cut down on that sinking in, and the paint will just sit right on the canvas, drying the way that you want. Instead with the other type of sinking in, it has a lot to do, I think, with fat over lean and what medium you're using when and what quantity. I, I, have, I have oiling out bottle, which is a very clear oil, which I will use in the smallest amount just to resaturate any area that needs resaturation. And I'll either use poppy, walnut, or a washed linseed, but it's going to be one of the clearest oils that I can, and I'm going to remove almost all of it at the end with a rag. So okay, it's almost... two more minutes. Did everybody get a chance? Come on up here before we get kicked out, or I get kicked out. <laughs> 